five years and still talking, this is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Talk like you've never heard it before. I just put on a new shirt today, and look at this. I'm going to have to go change my shirt. But I'll be wearing the same shirt in the interview we're about to do. A little bit later in the show tonight, uh, we'll have our citizens panel. And tonight, I'm kind of going to mention what my problem has been the last couple of weeks and let you know what's happening with it. Uh, so stay tuned for that. But meanwhile, speaking of Wilst, here's Wilst. Durst. Let's go out to San Francisco. Ladies and gentlemen, look at that visage. Look at that wizened face. Look at that. As years go on, you look more like the sage. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm talking about the spice, not the wisdom. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, that's uh, Will Durst, ladies and gentlemen. Boys and girls. From, Hi. Oh, yeah. From San Francisco, <laughs> California. How you doing, Will? It's all good. It's all good. It's a uh... Beautiful Tuesday, foggy, about 55, 57 mm -hmm. degrees right now, and uh, Debbie and I are going to go out for breakfast after this, and uh, that's about it. That's nice. You know, uh, I uh, I hear uh, that uh, you have to walk over the turds, though, in the streets in San Francisco now. Uh, yeah, there seems to be more human feces, but, uh, you know, it's part of the deal. It's a cost of doing business in the city. Yeah, make sure you wear good, solid shoes because you don't want to have a needle go through your foot. Exactly, exactly. It would be so embarrassing. Is it that bad? Point. I've heard it's terrible. Uh, well, you know how people are. They see one piece of human feces, and suddenly they're all... Uh, yeah, it's not that bad. It's, uh, you know, uh, I live in the Sunset District. I never see it, okay? Right. So it depends on where you are. There are homeless encampments. Uh, there are some right downtown. Uh, there are some uh, on Polk Street, right off of Polk Street. There are some under the freeway. So, yeah, there are places, and it's it's a good place to live. So even people who don't have homes. <laughs> it's a good place to live, even if you don't have a place to live. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Uh, because a Bubble said he was in Chicago last week. And he said, I was just amazed by what a clean town Chicago is compared to San Francisco. And you would think that Chicago would be dirty and San Francisco would be clean. Yeah, they have a clever program for the homeless. Uh, they call it Winter. <laughs> <laughs> kind of dissuades yeah, them. Yeah, it kind of dissuades also, them. Also, it's all so anecdotal. It depends on where you go. He was on the north side. He was at the Vic Theater. And the north side is kind of the yuppie, gentrified side, you yeah. know, of Chicago. Imagine if he went to, you know, uh, some some play, another locale yeah. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. That it would just be... As bad as San Francisco. Now, Maybe not as bad as San Francisco or Santa Monica. Here, Santa. See, that's that's me trying to push uh, <laughs> the San Francisco badness off on somebody else. So Santa Monica's bad too. Yeah. Let know, me bring so. let me bring this up because Bubs uh, just worked on a movie, and it turns yeah. out you were working on the same movie. Yeah, uh, it was Bubs and me and Lorenzo Lamas. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> he's a really nice guy really he, yeah he's really down to earth yeah he's not in acting he only does a couple projects every year yeah he has a real job he's a helicopter pilot he runs tourists out to avalon on catalina island uh, he just just a really nice guy it was weird wow that's cool yeah that's cool okay and bubbles bubbles was really good yeah, well, he said he only had a couple of lines. 
But now, here's the... Here, About teen lines. Yeah. Here's the thing. You played a character called... Gramps. <laughs> How do you feel about that? That you're now... The part you're able to get is Gramps. Yeah. Yeah, first movie, yeah. When you look uh, in the uh, mirror, do you see Gramps? Uh, actually, I do. Yeah, I do now, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it's okay. You know? yeah, yeah. Six and seven. It's part of the deal. Yeah, I was at Costco the other day, and some guy said, I'll be with you in a second, Pops. Pops? Yeah. <laughs> Pops? That that, that kind of kind of got to me. Effies or yeah. something? Yeah. You run at a drugstore? <laughs> so how many weeks did you have to work on this movie? It was about 10 days. About 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Hey, right, does it look like it'll be a good movie, or is it just... Um, I, I think it's too much of a play. I think it was written as a play, too internal. I haven't have it's it's one of those things where you're inside of it and you have no idea. Yeah. I just wish, I wish it had been taken outside uh, the house a couple times. And from what I've read to be, uh, led to believe that they did a scene. Uh, where people are protesting, and that was outside. So hopefully that'll cut it up a little. Bit. Yeah, that'll the open it. Acting, up. The acting was great. The direction was the guy had a lot of heart, and it was he was a first time director, and uh, this was uh, his project, and the and the support group. I mean, this was professional in Auburn. You know, it was it was just well, you uh, know you can take Hollywood anywhere, so don't go in Auburn. Yeah. It was professional for Auburn. No, no, it was it was prof in Auburn. It was in professional, Auburn. and it was in Auburn. So, yeah, that's on the uh, way up to Tahoe. The cinematographer was genius. The lighting yeah. guy was genius. You know, it was, it was, and the actors, the other actors, were really, really good. It was, we uh, he hooked into the Sacramento Mafia. Yeah. There's a group of Sacramento actors, and they have an acting teacher, and yeah. and they they're, they all know each. Yeah. Wow, that's terrific. Well, it sounds uh -huh. like you had a good time. Auburn, that's on the way to Tahoe. And this happened today. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's changing. So what's new? What's that? What paper is that in? Uh, San Francisco Chronicle. It's my column. It debut, debuted today. Oh, really? I got a bi-weekly column, but the easy way, because bi-weekly can mean twice a week or once every two weeks. And I'm once every two weeks, so I'm writing a column for the Chronicle. They pay dude today. Are they paying you decent money? No. No. <laughs> Why do you think? <laughs> Why do you think journalism? The state of journalism is such as it is today. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hold that up again. What's the what's your what's your headline today? Um, it is okay. San Francisco is changing. So what's new? Okay. Well, that's you know. Yeah, that's that's my conceit. You that, know, it always changes. San Francisco is the petri dish of social change. Oh, okay, all right. And it's supposed to be funny. It's like a Q and A. It's like frequently asked questions. You ever see that? Yeah, right. In a newspaper, that's what. No, okay. So, and how many words is it? About seven, seven hundred. Oh, seven. I thought you meant seven words. Yeah. <laughs> But Let's see. Really here. well spaced. W really well spaced. Yeah. yeah okay. So well, seven hundred. Uh, that's the movie in a column. Yeah. That's uh, that's uh, that's good. I know. Gee, your career's going somewhere. Yeah. Good timing, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's one o'clock your time. Uh, anyway, uh, somebody died that we I know we respected and. Uh, no. Yeah, Paul Krasner. 87. 87 years old. I, I, You know what I feel guilty about? I haven't talked to him in years. I feel guilty about that. It would have been nice had I talked to him a little bit in the last couple of years. You know, Paul Krasner, in case people don't know, was the publisher and editor of The Realist, a magazine that came out that was, how, how can we describe it? Uh, well, he was writing for Mad Magazine at the time. Mm -hmm. And he and he decided that this was like in the early '60s, and he decided that there needed to be a Mad Magazine for adults instead of teenagers, and that's what the Realist was. 
and it was satire. Really? Yeah. That's that's simple. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know it started that way, uh, but uh, I do know that he had at one point financial problems keeping it open. And, Many. And I bankrolled him. Really? Yeah. To keep it open, keep it going. He said, I need like, I don't know, a couple thousand bucks, something like that. And I said, no problem. I had the money at the time, and I had Gary write him a check. And he got it back to me, by the way. No shit. Got it back to me. Uh, but uh, I kind of felt proud of that, you know, being able to bail out the, the realist. The realist? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, she- you you were uh, you helped with Midnight Blue, which was kind of like the video version of of the realist. Nah, not really, not really. It was the video version of me trying to get my nut off. <laughs> What's wrong? <with laughs> <You know? laughs> but Krasner, I mean, he edited uh, Lenny's autobiography, How mm-hmm. to Talk Dirty and Influence People. That's right, and um, you. Fr- title was based uh, people these days don't get the title but it was based on the whole dale carnegie thing you know right. how to influence people and right it. and he uh, also um uh and people forget this i don't think i saw this in any of the uh, obituaries he was the editor for about a year of hustler magazine that's right larry flint yeah yeah, yeah. so you know i mean it uh, uh that was, I think it was at the time when Larry wanted to turn it into a religious publication. Do you remember that? No. Yeah. No. And everybody. Did you know Larry Flint? Uh, yeah, I've known Larry over the years. You know. Uh, Pre chair or post chair? Well, post, oh, uh, uh, both. Both. Uh, I knew him, the first time I ever met him was at uh, Screw Magazine years ago when we did. Uh, Goldstein did an interview with him for Midnight Blue. Oh, wow. Yeah. And uh, as the years went on, uh, I would bump into him. And my uh, the guy who started Midnight Blue with me, Bruce David, became his, uh, his editor for Hustler for years. And that's how I started writing for Hustler. I had a column every month for about six years. Oh, no shit. Yeah, yeah. What book. was it on? Anything I wanted to. It wasn't didn't have to be sex or anything like monthly? that. Huh? Monthly? Uh, monthly, yeah. Oh. Yeah, there were three columnists. Um, I'm trying to remember who the other two were. They, if I mentioned their names, you'd know exactly who they were. And um, uh, it was uh, it was 1,200 words, I think, per column. Gee. And... Um, you pay you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the beginning, got paid pretty well, actually. I used to make uh, a dollar a word. Fuck it, eh? Yeah, yeah. Then they lowered it down to like three hundred a column. You know, when when things weren't going good. Uh, yeah. Uh, that uh, yeah, but um, uh, uh, it was uh, it, you know it's pretty good all the way around. You know, and uh, I I wrote on any number of things. I mean, everything from uh, very few things on sex. They were basically cultural or whatever. Um, well, that's what the the redeeming feature of that magazine was. And then I also wrote uh, articles for them. I, I wrote a whole 3,000-word th- uh, column, uh, column or, or article about the death of Air America. Uh, oh. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I was doing some very significant writing for them for years. That was... The death of Air America. When was that? Like two thousand six, something like that. Six well, seven. It was recent. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I did all. I stopped. Yeah, right. I think it was like two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Yeah. 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 But so I, I mean, was, I have all the columns here that I wrote. Uh, twelve they were, years ago. Huh? That was like twelve years ago. Yeah. I remember you took me up to the offices of uh, of Al Goldstein. Screw and- Magazine. Took me to Screw Magazine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a dump. It was. Yeah, that's all I remember. Just, uh, uh, but magazines and newspapers all around, and you know the way you, the way you would think that a New York magazine, that you know an underground magazine, 
would look like. Well, was, publishers, publishers, and and people who ran magazines never had much uh, care for the surroundings they worked in, uh, and uh, so most of these places. I'm sure if you went to Mad Magazine, it was a dump too. You know, in the early years. So uh, that's just the way things go. But uh, you know, having to do a column every month made me into a writer. You know, uh, um, and I, I'm yeah. You know, what? yeah, it's always hanging over your head that deadline, man. Oh, I, you know, I would sit there and I go, oh, hey, it's due in three days. Oh, God. And then I would just sit down here and just do it, you know. Uh, but I'm still in high school. If it's due Monday morning, I don't start it till after the Sullivan show. Yeah. Well, I mean, part of the reason for that is your best inspiration comes out of desperation. <laughs> You know, and that desperation of I got to get this done, I got to get this done is, uh, you know. Necessity is the mother of invention. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, um, yeah, I mean, I wrote on, on everything. My favorite column that I wrote, oddly enough, was one titled Who Killed Uncle Remus? Uh, about Song of the South, Disney's film, and how it had been not seen in this country in years and that it was really. Uh, a sad thing and I t told the history behind it and why it wasn't racist and why uh, they should release it here in America so people can see it because it was a wonderful picture and the performance by uh, I think his name was James Baskett was his name or Bassett uh, as as Uncle Remus is one of the two or four performances in film and he, he got, even got an honorary Academy Award for it uh, what ha what happened? Uh, people just figured. NAACP it was came along and said this is racist, and so they did away with it. You know, the only thing you ever saw of it was maybe a clip of uh, Bassett singing uh, uh, "Zippity Doo Dah." Uh, oh, that's from uh, yeah, that won the Academy Award for Best Song that year. Yeah. You know, uh, but it's a it's a nice little film, and I often felt it was a shame that it had been just. Bleh, you know, killed. So, oh, anyway. where can you see it? Uh, how about Japan? You know, you can go online and find a copy of it. I bet you YouTube. Yeah, yeah, you you can find copies of it, but it was it's not sold in America to this day. It's not sold in America, and and Disney keeps saying, "Well, we're constantly rethinking it and rethinking it." And there was nothing racist about it, you know. They didn't like the the you know this about Brer Rabbit and uh, uh, one of the episodes is how he does uh, how he how he outwits the fox and the bear by making a tar baby and then they tried to go after the tar baby and got ensnared in the tar and tar baby has always been this term people have used for black people and uh, they found that racist. Well, it wasn't racist at all, you know. He outsmarted him. He outsmarted him. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, uh, it, it's just uh, you know. It, uh, anyway, that was one of my favorite articles. So I, you know, so far out of field, that, you know. But every month I got to just rant about stuff, and it uh, for it, six years, huh? For six years. For six years. Yeah, yeah. Might have been longer than that. I don't know, but I think it was six years. Wow. Well, by the time they finally killed the column, uh, I had, uh, uh, you know, I, I I had done about six years, I think. I'm I'm trying to remember how long it was exactly, but I have all the columns here. There are like twelve per year for six years. Okay, it's a lot of a lot of writing, and I I have the rights to them. So I was thinking years ago of doing a book out of it, but I'm lazy. What can I say? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just lazy. You think well, you're more. Not, you care you're more. Renaissance man. You, well, you care more about your writing than I care about mine. You know. So uh, anyway, what do you think about the world around us? Well, everybody's uh, spending so much time chronicling the horse race uh, on uh, MSNBC and CNN. They're so worried about who's leading the polls now. It's, a, it's over a year away. It doesn't matter who's leading the polls, and I don't know why they're so focused on it. I really don't. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's ridiculous because whoever in the lead now might be in the back 
you know, six months from now. You don't know how things are going to go. No, and they're spending all this time on it rather than focusing on what uh, the uh, the Oompa, Oval Office Oompa Loompa is doing, which is like lying and cheating and stealing. Although tomorrow will be interesting to see if Mueller yeah. uh, says anything yeah. that we haven't heard. Well, I think he maybe p- keep his car- cards close to his vest, but at least they can kind of like corner him and say, okay, what did you mean by that doesn't mean that he's innocent. It just means I'm not making a, a judgment here. Uh, and he's going to ha- kind of have to give that some edification. you know. So but the Justice Department supposedly told him not to talk about anything uh, that wasn't in the report, not to talk about conclusions, not to talk about uh, any uh, uh, revelations about the anybody who wasn't charged. Mm-hmm. Uh, he can't talk about anything that might have to do with executive privilege. I mean, it's all the things the Justice Department told him he didn't, he couldn't talk about. So they kind of neutered him. Well, is executive privilege hiding facts? You know, uh, and keeping uh, yeah, fa- yeah. I I don't know. It's all lawyers speak. Yeah, I don't know what they can do to him. What if he does, you know, he says, well, there was a time that Trump met with the guy that we found out, but we didn't tell anybody, yeah. and now I'm telling you for the first time. And What's the Justice Department going to do? Are they going to put uh, Mueller in jail? He just doesn't seem to have the type of personality where he's going to buck the system, you know? Yeah, yeah. Plus, I mean, um, I, I, just, I, I just think that the Democrats should play this game by not going after Trump, but by making their case of how they can make things better and talk about bringing back to this country a certain civility that it is lacking at this moment, you know, and appealing to them that way. I think that may play, but I think going after Trump constantly is kind of boring. I can't even watch MSNBC anymore. I mean, it's so boring because I know where they're going to fall on any particular subject. Nobody ever surprises me. Yeah. And, and I, I think, I don't know about you, but I would, I would love, I'd love to go get news from people who are going to give me, um, uh, uh, an open-minded view of what's going on and not just spend the whole time saying, I, well, we got Trump today, boy, we got him on this and we got him on that. You know, I think that's a complete waste of time. I think a better part of spending their time in the news business is to just simply report what's going on. You know, I I found myself watching uh, CBSN. Are you familiar with CBSN? Mm-hmm. CBSN is a news app, and they do constant 24-7 broadcasting on the app. And they're kind of like they're reporting everything. Okay, including foreign news and what's happening in foreign countries. And when it comes to Trump saying something, they simply reported what he said. They don't sit around parsing it saying, oh, isn't this horrible what he said? Oh, that's horrible. They just report it. And I, I find that refreshing. You know, so I find myself going on the app and watching CBSN more and more often. You know, what do you use as your news source? Anything? Uh, well, I'm exactly... Um, in line with you, I, I watch MSNBC and I then I can't watch it anymore. I can't watch it. Yeah. And then I can't not watch it. So I go through these phases. Uh, I watch it, I can't watch it, I can't not watch it. I, 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 I shut off from everything. I try to go fishing, but then I hate fishing. So uh, I, I purge myself. I have, I have a fast, a media fast. And I listen to music, but I yeah. hate music, so I go back to sports, and then all they talk about is the same thing on sports. It's like one issue. Yeah. And so that I go back to um, CNN. I try CNN, and there's the exacts. Yeah. Yeah, but nevertheless, you have to watch these people because you have to know what's going on because that's your business. Well, yeah, I need to. I need to, the. You know, let me know what's. Yeah. To, yeah. To, oh, I'll. You know, write. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, do you, you, what newspapers do you read? 
read? You read the Chronicle in San Francisco. Right? I read the Chronicle. Um, I read the uh, national edition of the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Debbie gets the Wall Street Journal. That's... I look at that sometimes. It's good, good paper. It's a good paper, yeah. Uh, and uh, then I do the web stuff. Uh, you know, I'll read USA Today if I'm at a hotel. Yeah. Because uh, I can give it away free. I'm not paying two bucks for that. Uh, and I'll pick up, you know, all the freebies. Uh, SF Weekly and the Bohemian and, you know, all anything. I'll read anything. And so what do you find gives you the most information for your act? Oh, I don't know. It's osmosis. It's just, I just sit there and I let everything kind of yeah. sink in. Because I'm listening for buzzwords and I'm listening for, you know, isolated phrases that I could put into uh, either the syndicated column or, or the, because, you know, it's two different voices when you write a column as when you do stand-up. Yeah. Uh, so you can only take one or two lines and put it in the stand-up. Uh, so I'm, I'm just listening, I'm, I'm just absorbing everything. And then yeah. I'm uh, regurgitating uh, the stuff that works. Well, you know, I mean, and you now have that even more wizened look as the years go on. So you look like the sage of political commentary. Yeah, I'm going for the uh, Mr. Miyagi now, look. All, all you need at that age now is an enlarged prostate, and you'll be fine. <clears throat> I got something. I don't know what I got, but I got something. Yeah, well, do you have to pee right now? I do. Oh, well, then you probably have an enlarged prostate. <laughs> I always thought that was God's little joke, you know, the prostate. Uh, you know, I mean, because it's like this donut-shaped uh, thing. And then the urethra goes right through it. And then as you age, it enlarges and presses down on the urethra so you have a hard time peeing. Uh, now, what didn't God say, hmm... Maybe I should move that over to the side. <laughs> so there is no God, right? Because God he in this... He was just saving space. He was saving space was, for the important. <laughs> that was one of the worst engineered things ever. <laughs> ever. You know. Hey, listen, we've run out of time already. Oh, no, not already. Uh, nice to finish on prostates. <laughs> Next time I'll try to do urethras. Yeah, yeah. Are you playing anywhere that uh, maybe some uh, people? Saturday, yeah. Come out to uh, Livermore, the Rets Laugh uh, uh, Vineyards. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's always a What's it outdoor. called? What's it called? The Ret Rets Laugh in Livermore. And Deb and Mike are opening, and some guy named Mean Dave is uh, the MC. So it's going to be a lot of fun. You're good. Saturday night. Good, because we have a lot of people in the San Francisco Bay Area who watch this. So. Oh, cool. Yeah, come out to Livermore. Nobody else, but, uh, or, you know, anyway. Or, or look for my column every two weeks in the, in the, I, I lost in, it. In yeah. the San Francisco but, Chronicle, Chronicle, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah. First, every two weeks. It's first, bi -weekly, first one is today, weeks. right? First one, it de debuts today. Okay, and so. It's on SF Gates if you want to look it up. Ladies and gentlemen, he's lovely, he's wonderful, he's Will Durst. Thanks, Will. Thanks, thanks for going uh, going through with me all my problems here with the technical things. Oh, we had some technical problems at the beginning. You're a genius. See you later, Will. Five years and still talking. This is GabNet, the Great American Broadcast Network. Talk like you've never heard it before. And that's Will Durst. And, uh, see, I changed my shirt. Now, isn't that better? It doesn't have the... Yeah, I got that off of a uh, off a TV commercial in which the person had this collar was constantly going bad. So they said, "Oh, if you wash it with such and such, it won't do that." Well, apparently, girlfriend didn't get the message, and we're not uh, we're not um, uh, washing it with us and us. Anyway, uh, let me open up the uh, the uh, lines here to our um, to our potential citizen panel. Uh, 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 I don't know. I've been thinking about today about actually telling you what's been going on with my life. Uh, but we'll wait and get the show going here before I decide whether I'm going to do it or not. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a personal um, um, 
health matter, which uh, I just didn't want to talk about because it was bothering me so much. And uh, the reason it's not bothering me as much today and why I could probably maybe talk about it is because I um, uh, 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 have, have come with some, up with some solutions to the problem and so on. And uh, so I thought I would maybe, maybe talk about it. But let me see what happens. Let's see who we get on the uh, citizen panel. As I sit here and wait for the first person to call, uh, I know we're going out there, uh, so I know people know that we're on, and uh, they can call, and if they don't, well, then I'll just sit here with my finger up my ass, which, you know, is, is not the worst feeling in the world, actually, as you get older, because you want somebody to have something. And, well, not really. Let me not even get into that. Anyway, we're waiting for our first caller tonight. Let's see here. I know Charlie's out there. He's online right now. And uh, who else? Anybody else is out there right now? Uh, no, but I we're not. Uh, my line. The lines are open. Um, so all we have to do is wait and see if somebody deigns to call us. Okay. Um, uh, let me see here. Uh, yeah, we talked about uh, we talked about Paul Krasner. Uh, oh, here we go. Oh. Let me see here. Here's Charlie. Here's here's Charles Wallace. Uh, Charlie, I probably don't even uh, need Charlie. to I don't even need to find a place for because if you look closely, um, he's there already. I don't even have to do it because sure. he was there before. Hi Charlie, how are you? Hey Alex, how's your uh, how's your better. how's your life going? Pretty good. I've, I've d discovered I'm allergic to bug bites. Really? <laughs> you never yeah. you yeah, never my whole face swell up over the weekend. Wait a minute, I, oh, I can bugs. see on your right side of your face, right? Yeah. What yeah. what kind of bug though? Is it just a particular bug? I have no idea. I never saw it. The only bug I've seen is a little bug, sort of looks like a flea, except I squashed him. I did have my yeah. blood. Probably was biting me, but it's not a mosquito. Yeah, let me see here. There's Phil, so I got to find him a space because he was on uh, the second uh, uh, template before, but now we have to put him into the first one. So let's see here. Does he does he come up? There he goes. Hello, Phil. How are you? Hey. Good evening. How you doing? Okay. Uh, what was your weekend like? I uh, worked Saturday, Sunday. I went shooting, and I uh, slept the rest of the day. When you say shooting, with the camera? No, with the gun. Oh, geez. You see, you have to specify what you're using <laughs> yeah. when you shoot. Uh, so we know when to get out of the way. <laughs> you know. Uh, I, I keep breaking parts, you know. So do uh, I. No, uh, that's a uh, <laughs> story all together. Yeah, I just I just had to uh, order a new one. Uh, this is called an extractor. And uh, as I was shooting on Sunday, all of a sudden I failed to extract the spent cartridge, and I would get a double feed. So I we have no idea company. what you're talking about. Nope. It, it's a failure to fire. <laughs> you yep. know, I got that uh, in many ways. Well, how do you but, fail to fire? I thought you uh, just put a bullet in a gun and shot it. Well, that's true, except uh, guns are very uh, intricate, and there are uh, many parts that make it uh, perform. And one of the parts is the one that after you fire the, the round, it pulls the spent cartridge out mm -hmm. and it, it ejects it so that the uh, fresh cartridge can be sent up from the magazine and into the barrel. Yeah. Well, uh, the uh, part that pulls the spent pull it out mm -hmm. uh, has a little hook on it and it hooks around the end of the cartridge well if the tip of the hook breaks uh you it, there's nothing to pull the cartridge out so the next cartridge comes up and is not a, 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 in, so in what the you're saying to way. us here is the people who think guns are going to protect them in their home it probably doesn't do shit because it, you might have this problem with your gun and then you're dead yeah well i shoot a lot and my Gun, the, the particular gun I was using is maybe 35, 40 years old. And uh, I uh, 
this is the first time it broke. Yeah, let me see here. I gotta get uh, a Stein Zeller in here. Where's Stein Zeller? There we go. Okay, he's in the first place. He's right on top. There we go. So, um, oh wait a minute, we just lost him. That was fast. That, well, that was fast, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, he'll probably call back, so I'll just leave him right there. He sees frozen folks up up there, right there. He's frozen. See this this little piece of metal? Yeah. Thirty seven dollars. Why? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, it's that's what it is. Does it it's blow you? Does it blow you? Oh, does it? It does, and you know, it sends me a thank you afterwards. No, oh, really? Uh, okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I just wonder about that. What ha what happened to uh, fifty cents worth of metal? Yeah. Uh, if that. Yeah. What happened to Jeff? Well, we'll leave Jeff there until if somebody else calls, I'll put them in that spot. But uh, yeah. Uh, apparently, he had a problem, as it were. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, uh, a lot of people were very... They, what? They sent me a sticker. Uh -huh. <laughs> I get a sticker and a piece of what, what is that sticker for? Oh, it says a Wilson Combat. Well, what's uh, Wilson Combat? It's a uh, custom uh, gunsmith and uh, gun or uh, making company. Really? So, yeah, so they, uh, they make extreme high-quality... Uh, yeah, guns. I wonder if, is, if didn't Jeff the other night say he didn't know he was off? Yeah, yeah. That, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, he did. Maybe I should just call him back here. Let's see here. Sure. Let's see. I don't. I usually don't like to call people, unless uh, that. Okay, here we go. I'll, I'll call Jeff Stein and let's see here, Adam, and let's see if he picks up, because uh, he might not know that he he's off. Yeah. So that's a possibility. Yeah. So. Just another service here that we do. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, when he comes to visit you, you may, uh, you know, want to go over the protocols of calling. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it says calling Jeff Stein, calling Jeff Stein. Oh, here he is. He is back again. There we go. Let's see here. Uh, um, no. God damn it. What's the problem? He somehow... Um, hmm. Well, I have no idea. I have no idea. Call back again, Jeff. Call back again. There we go. Here comes Jeff again. Now we'll see. There, there we go. Now there we go. Hi, did Jeff. You, did you know that uh, you you weren't on, Jeff, or did you? Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Not like on. last time. Yeah. What, what what's the problem? You figure? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, Jeff. Oh, sure, I wouldn't have the problem. Yeah. The answer is it was the prostate. <laughs> uh, it's it was yeah. Your prostate. What's What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I just think I think there. Uh, I believe there's no God. And if I if I die and there is a God, I, the first question I'm asking him is why did you make that fucking prostate that way? <laughs> yeah. You know, because yeah. that, because and then I'm gonna have to say to him. And you don't say this usually to God, but if he's a loving God, as was reported, uh, I could look him straight in the face and say, "Well, you really fucked up." Uh, what what is uh, what is a person that hates all people? Misanthrope. 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 Yeah, well, mm -hmm. that's, that's that was the deal. He's a misanthrope. Right. Well, he no, he hates men. So you know something? God may be a woman. That's yep. a possibility. Yeah. Otherwise, a lesbian woman. A woman who said, who said, who uh, said, by the way, I'm going to make man, but you know, I'm going to do something here. They won't, yeah. they, they, you know, because almost give them this extra rib so it's hard to bend over. Well, I'm, you know, any young person who's listening, although we, I'm sure we don't have any young people listening, you got to know that when you reach a certain age, it's going to be a lot harder to pee. Okay, period. I don't care who you are. I don't know a single older guy who doesn't have an enlarged prostate. Well, you know, I had a friend that warned me about that, I don't know, 40 years ago, and he told me to drink this stuff called spirulina. And spirulina is some awful tasting uh, <laughs> algae that they get in Africa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even if you hold your nose, you can't get it down. And so I didn't drink the spirulina, and look what happened. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> I lost my prostate. Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe you should start taking it now. 
I should, now, now it's too late. I have no prostate. <laughs> now, I don't know if there's anything that can prevent you from having that happen. It's a natural thing. I mean, here's the problem. Uh, men have uh, male hormones, and male hormones uh, from the testes uh, affect, not- yeah, affect all that and also affect your prostate. And, uh, you know, people who come down with prostate cancer, many of the solutions, one of the solutions is uh, giving them hormones that is like uh, chemical castration that prevents them from producing uh, the male testosterone hormone, which then the cancer uh, thrives on and can't get enough, uh, get any of, and so therefore you find that the cancers actually die in a lot of the people prostate cancer because of feeding them male hormones or depriving female. them of male hormones. Yeah. No, you don't give them female hormones. It's, uh-huh. it's the thing that deprives them of that. Uh-huh. And uh, But, you know, that, I, I don't know if that's the best idea either because the side, there are a lot of side effects there, like growing breasts. Well, I don't know if that's a side <coughs> effect. I won't need a woman anymore. That's for damn sure. I can just feel myself up. Uh, but uh, also a lot of things is fatigue, uh, you l- 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 lessening of muscle strength, things like that. You know, it happens anyway. Because but know, you get, get to old. live. You get to live another ten years as a eunuch. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So and, it's, uh, the the other part is you can't climb ladders anymore. You know, you can't have young people do it. Well, I used to do that yeah. now. <laughs> No, you yeah. know, in the old days, I used to be able to hop on top of a table and change a light bulb. Right, yeah. I can't get on top of the table anymore. I can't get on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> you see, that's the problem. Oh, here comes Tony Magno. He can get on the chair. Huh? He can get on he the get chair. He's still young. Yeah. Huh? Let me see here. What do we got here? <laughs> we got, let me see, put him in the four spot. Tony... Uh, Tony Quisp, there he is. Okay, boom. boom. Tony, move to the side a little so we can see more of that uh, <laughs> wallpaper. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Still she's sleeping, thank no. God. Well, really? She's, she's cool. sleeping? Yeah. Well, she just called me. Hopefully, she's out for the night. Is that what they call it, sleep? Uh, even though she's not breathing? I gave her the children's Benadryl. That puts her out a little bit. It's only 10 milligrams. Children's Benadryl? Don't give her that. Give her the heaviest dose she can let, you can lay your hands on. I mean, it, it doesn't do anything. I think it's all in her head. She just likes to take it because it puts her like into a little sleepy fest. I, I think it's all in her head. I'll tell you what I've done now for sleeping is I was taking like uh, one night I would take this thing for my, uh, my neuropathy uh, that would kind of help me go to sleep. Another pill was the uh, um, Xanax, okay. Uh, and uh, I decided if I'm just going to, I didn't care if I didn't sleep well, I was not going to be doing it any longer. And I just take a little hit of pot at night before I go to sleep. And I've, now I've gone, I'm going to sleep every night without the use, most of the time, without the use of, say, Xanax or whatever. And I'm feeling, like tonight, I'm feeling pretty lucid. You know. See that, Tony? Just take a pot and hit your mom Actually, over the head with I'm it, and you'll start, be fine. I'm going to start. No, that's but not, you know what I noticed, too? What? The air conditioner was, is starting to bother me. I can't sleep close to the air conditioner anymore. I got all dried out. Like You know when you wake up the next morning and you feel like you're congested with the Get cold? a humidifier, Tony. They oh, make I these I can't humidifiers. Sleep. I the air conditioner. Yeah, oh, but yeah. it has been so humid here. Oh, yeah. I mean, Alex. it's so humid. How humid is it? It was so oh, we humid. We heard it was 111 degrees. No, it was, no, it was 72 degrees today, and I couldn't go out into the other part of the apartment and had to keep the air conditioners on because the humidity was so unbearable today. Oh, it was very good. Just I amazing. Couldn't even leave the house. Huh? I'm going out. You ought to come oh, right back here. The whole country is hearing that the Midwest and the East Coast is under a tremendous heat wave. 111, yeah. 113. How about you, right. t- Charlie? How much is it where you are right now? Oh, it, it actually, it's uh, rained a little bit today, so I only got up to 105. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> I'll check. Yeah. Weather, huh? Love to live in the desert, right? Anyway, so that's that's what happened, you know? Um, and uh, it, it's, not been, it's not been wonderful. It's been quite ugly. But 79 here right now. Huh? 79. But the uh, the uh, uh, Walnut Creek, but it was 90. Oh well, uh, we we you know we were yeah 
Yeah, we're okay. Yeah. I never forget when I went to San Fran to see the Mets play with my brother. Mm. We checked into the hotel and we were going to go to the game that night. So I went out with shorts. And the guy at the hotel says, you're going to be coming back in about 10 minutes and change. And, and Alex, it was so cold, like you said, from the wind. I never put shorts yeah. on the whole trip. But anyway, so he talks about get, he talks about getting a humidifier, but that's exactly. not going to help anything. You need a For the de- air conditioner. dehumidifier. Well, no, no. He said he was drying out from the air conditioner. Yeah, I so, felt like so cold on my head. Like, if when I he gets up. one of those well, little humidifiers. But you do have you do room. have a humidifier kind of in the air conditioner. No, that air conditioning okay. takes the humidity out okay, of the air. Then, then, okay, okay, then that's a dehumidifier. That's your try. That's so that's then, what air conditioning Then does. the humidifier would add humidity. Humidity. So if you've got a dehumidifier on and a humidifier on, do you, hit, do you hit a kind of a, a, a cosmic conflict there where the no, whole room no, just blows the up? Totally the like air conditioner check. takes the humidity out of the air, but it cools the air. Mm-hmm. So what you want to do is have the cool air, but you still want some humidity in it so that it's not so dry. Yeah, yeah that like I yeah. felt like the it was so cold when I woke up. I had like that. You ever feel it over your eyes? Yeah, that's like, what I, I, I need. That's what I need. Away. Another electric instrument going uh, to raise I the electric I'm, bill. Like well, my, my in, electric. In my old house, I had a thing called an April Air, and I had uh, forced air heating with a furnace. Mm-hmm. And this and this April Air, you could set the humidity level that you wanted, and it puts little drops of moisture in the plenum, where uh, where the uh, heat or the uh, air conditioning uh, would would run through. And uh, by doing that, I maintained a consistent humidity. You know, this is the kind of programming people want to listen to. This is why they <laughs> seek out this podcasts. This is important stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> All yeah, I know is my electric bill My electric bill went up yeah. $100 last month. Yeah? Yeah. Well, that, that's because of the new Mac computer. And this month, <laughs> this month, I'm expecting <laughs> it to go up even higher. Mm-hmm. because It's it, the air conditioner? We haven't had the air conditioner off for a month. Yeah. I mean, it's been that bad here. You know? I hate going outside. I hated it. Yeah. I was going. I couldn't stand it. I went right into the stop and shop. I just didn't want to go in the heat. Yeah. You should live with Charlie. Lives. Lives. I well, I had to. Food. I had to go out uh, on one of the hottest days, which was Monday, uh, because uh, I had to go to the dentist, and so I have to go to Rockefeller Center, and then I have to walk like six blocks, and it's like a death march in that way. No cabs. Huh? No cabs in Rockefeller Center? Well, why am I going to take a cab to go five blocks, for crying out loud, Phil? Because it's 111 degrees. I don't care. So anyway, I, I did that. I went, you know, i got to tell you something. I, um, I went to the dentist the other day. You know, I went to the dentist to go get a implant. And the guy looks at my mouth and says, well, we got to clean your teeth first. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's uh, let's t- let's take some X-rays here. So I took some. They took some X-rays and they found a couple of cavities, some very close to the nerves. So they said we got to take care of those before we can do that. And I said, you know, by the time we do those things, I'm not going to be able to afford to do that until <laughs> until the beginning of next year when my uh, uh, dental insurance replenishes itself. Okay. So they started in the other day, uh, this dentist who Marjorie found. He was just upstairs from where she worked. And she said, this woman's terrific. Um, uh, did this tooth that we thought might have to be root canal, but she didn't have to do it. She worked on it. She got it just right. And uh, she says, hopefully everything will stay the way it is. And now we have to do another tooth uh, next week. And then we have a big filling back here, and it, it's cracked. The filling is cracked. There's no, no decay in there, but it's a cracked filling. And then once I take care of that, we can get on with the implant, which I can't afford now to do till next year, <laughs> you know, till January 1st. So, but the thing that was great is you ever go to a doctor, and all of a sudden you realize how the doctor, and in this case dentist, that you were going to was absolutely terrible. Mm-hmm. And what hey, being there with a really professional dentist is like. And this yeah. woman I had who did my teeth the other day was just incredible. I mean, she gave me a shot of Novocaine I didn't even feel. That's a good dentist. Yeah, you know. yeah my dentist, I, never, I don't even have to ask for a topical before they do the Novocaine anymore. It just, you know, he shoots it in there and it's fine. 
Yeah, she just, uh, she was, and she was wonderful. She did a great job, uh, terrific, you know. And, and the whole thing, she worked on it an hour uh, with, with, after my insurance took care of it, it was only like $96. Oh, wow, that's pretty good. Yeah, and, and how uh, come she didn't see these cavities? Yeah, yeah he, huh? How come she didn't see these cavities? Who? Did they just the the one that uh, this uh, woman dentist that did you up uh, uh, a year or so ago? Because uh, uh, number one, I hated her so much I wouldn't go for a cleaning, so we never mm -hmm. got X-rays going. And even if we did, you know, she just let stuff go. And she she, she was the one that put this filling in my mouth that when I went home it fell out. Yeah, I remember okay, that, yeah. you know, and I went, what kind of a dentist is this, yeah. you know? So, but this woman is like fixing up my mouth, you know, it's terrific. And I figure as long as I may have some money left over, I might replace a crown or something like that. But it, uh, uh, the other thing that got me is they started cleaning and they said, we can only do half your mouth. Well, and you let it go all this time. Well, I say, why? And she said, because the insurance company says they will only do two, uh, pay for two quarters a session. She needed a new chisel. Yeah, <laughs> so, so I have to, I'm going back tomorrow to get the other half of my mouth clean. And then I'm going Which half there. did she clean? Uh, the this upper, half. the lower, this half. the side? This half. That half. Yeah, and then, to, feel different than then the other half? next week she's going to do another filling, and then I have a more filling to go. So what have you. You know, that's a, it's a, that's the story of my life. But being able to find a dentist that really just surprised the living daylights out of me, how good this woman was, and how professional they run the office, you know? She's a woman comes in and says, yes, you're gonna get a, uh, a filling today, you will owe $96, okay? And then she said, but if we have to do a root canal, uh, that will cost you off your insurance $300, but, we hope we don't have to do that. Well, it only came to $96. It came to cheaper than the cleaning, okay? Yeah, they charged me like 150 Yeah, so, I mean, it was really, it was really, uh, to, uh, really, she, but she's the, just a well-run business, okay? I get cleanings three times a year. They charge me 175 bucks. So with the new dental insurance I got, which I found out it's not Delta Dental, it's Emeritus. And, uh, and it's because I called up my dentist and I said, hey, I got this insurance, but I can't find you on the uh, preferred dental list. Yeah. And uh, it, it turns out that he takes Delta, but, uh, but not Emeritus. So I call the agent and the agent says, this is the best you can get, you know. And, yeah, maybe uh, the best you can get is just nobody takes it. Well, you, you, uh, know, what happens is yeah. if you go to somebody like Delta Dental to in-network, yeah. They tell the dentist how much they can charge for the procedure. Like, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, an implant, they cost out at $3,200, of which I pay half. That's not bad, okay? No, no. But when I got one before, it cost me close six to six grand. grand. Uh oh. Yeah, you know, so if you go to a dentist that's in network, then they have to go along with how much Delta Dental says they can charge for the procedure. So makes it good uh, I have been uh, been uh, uh, trying to figure out if I want to talk about this um, uh, you know I was off for a couple of nights a couple uh, what was it two weeks ago something like that uh, and um, I was uh, very upset um, and uh, I still I still am but not but there have been some developments that have made me less upset. Um, I went and got my numbers on my PSA test, and it had jumped up about two points, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is not, I'm still like at 6.7, which is still not huge, okay? It's normal. Huh? But you're, it's normal. For my age, it's close to normal. Yeah, but, but, let me, let me say this. To begin with, PSA test, in case people don't know, is a test that checks for uh, prostate-specific antigens. Uh, and if they're too high a level, it, it could mean you have cancer, prostate cancer. It could also mean you have an enlarged prostate or infection in the prostate. It could, my doctor, in fact, my, my GP told me, you can get it from sitting down too long, wow. okay, before the test. 
So is that how you lost your virginity? That's how I lost my virginity. Yeah. Um, but uh, and there was a thing called the free PSA, which if it's over ten, then okay. But uh, under ten, and this was a point nine, uh, there's a chance you've got cancer. Okay. So my doctor says to me, you now he started giving me, he started having me go, up, I started seeing him about three years ago, and every half a year he would have me go for a PSA test. Now, when I first started out with the PSA test, it was somewhere like about a 2.5 or something like that. Very low, you had very low PSA. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's gone up over the years. Um, and uh, he keeps sending me back to get PSA tests. Now, Everything I have read online about PSA tests is that the recommendation from the National Urological Association, uh, the uh, whatever, any number of, of uh, medical organizations, AMA, is do not give prostate exams, uh, do not give PSA tests to men over the age of 75. And the theory on that is, is that what you would do if it goes up is, is, is really... Nothing. It, well, you shouldn't do it. You know, it means that people will do unnecessary biopsies. They will do unnecessary this, unnecessary that. They'll give them unnecessary treatments. And the chances are that a person of 75 has a life expectancy of about 10 years. That's depressing. Uh, a life expectancy of 10 years. And in that 10 years, even if they had prostate cancer, it would be so slow growing that by the time that it became anything, they probably would have died of something else. All right? So after 75, you don't give prostate, you don't give PSA tests. Well, this doctor kept giving me PSA tests. And every time I would go in, he would stick something up my ass, whether it was his finger or his magic wand or whatever. And he would also wand me and, and check the... Uh, uh, my system, you know, which is fine. I, I don't mind them using, uh, what is it they, they do for pregnant women? Uh, a uh, uh, Ultrasound. Ultrasound. I don't mind them doing an ultrasound. But anyway. You know uh, why the guy was sticking his finger up your yeah, ass? He only stuck my finger up my ass once, which made me suspicious because, believe it or not, sticking a finger up somebody's ass is the gold standard mm -hmm. in, in prostate He, he had lost his ring the first time he did it. Yeah, right, yeah. right. No, but he, no, he, the since. first time he ever did it was just one visit ago, yeah. okay? Uh, and and I don't think he found anything there because I think he would have mentioned it. He's, I said, was it okay? He says, prostate's a little large. You've got some calcium deposits, but otherwise it looks okay. And um, so now I come in when I get this 6-7, and he says, um, I think we better do a biopsy. Wow. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. And uh, I he set the whole thing up on what I was supposed to go in for the biopsy, which is uh, a, a week from Monday. And I have just been so bothered by this because somehow I see it as maybe being unnecessary that he's padding the bill, just like he padded it every time I went there by using the ultrasound. Uses the ultrasound, yeah. he gets to throw another four hundred dollars onto the bill. Okay, and and so I, I'm, and then I said to him after he told me about this. Okay, there are a lot of little nuances to this story. Uh, that I said, well, do you want to, you know, do a digital just to see if you can fit, find anything? He says, well, if it's small, I won't be able to feel it. I went. Okay, I don't know how that makes sense, but you you know, you could at least try, you know. Uh, what about going for another well, Wait, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Let me finish my story. All right. So I start reading up on all of this, and that's the worst thing I can do because well, ev everything too. drives me nuts, okay? Um, and uh, I was unbearable to live with during this period. And I... I um, was you know I read enough of this stuff to say what are they doing giving me PSA tests after seventy five, and secondly, uh, what what's he doing giving me a biopsy when at my age it it could be a little dangerous, okay? Uh, it's a procedure. Yeah. They yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, it's a medical procedure. They don't have to put you out, although he was going to put me out. Okay. So he said, by the way, as long as you've 
you know, he says, you've got to go to your doctor, your personal physician, and get him to do a checkup to okay you for this procedure. So I made an appointment with my doctor, and I went to see him. And he took, they drew the blood and all that, and they figured as long as I'm coming in in a month for my regular yearly, they'll just take that blood test and look at it now too, you know. But they did all that. And then I sat down with the doctor, and I said to him, I told him this story about what was happening. And I said, you know, I just find that him giving me a biopsy may be overkill, you know, that the tendency is to wait and watch, you know, watch and wait. Uh, check out the prostate every, every six months or so, see how much, if this is growing that much, or see if it goes down or whatever, but don't necessarily plunge into a biopsy and then plunge into the cure. How about a CT scan? Well, let me finish, Phil. All right. You know, CT scans are fine. They can do that. They prefer to do uh, MRIs, which I don't like, but I don't think you, they put your whole body in the MRI no. for this. No, the CT scan, they, sh they shoot uh, some... Yeah, I know, uh, I know I've had a CT scan, Phil. Oh. Yeah, but I'm saying they talk about getting an MRI, and I think an MRI will... Uh, did they do a CT scan for your prostate? Yes. Oh, okay. uh, they do it for the cancer. You know, to, to, they're able to see... Uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah. But they prefer, they prefer um, an MRI is what they yeah. prefer. But, uh, and I'll do it if they don't put my whole body in there. If they just put the bottom part of my body in there, I'll be That's happy. That's all they need. That's all they need. Uh, but anyway, the point is this that I talked to my doctor, and he said, you know, it's, it, it, I, he says, I'm, I don't know, I, he goes to the same doctor, and I said, there's another problem. He says, well, where's he going to do this operation? I said, his office. And he went, oh. <laughs> and I said, well, why, oh? He says, well, I'm his, a patient of his as well, and I've been to his office, and they're filthy. Okay. You don't want to get it back. Yeah, you can get sick for that right away. Yeah, you know? yeah. Seven, I, felt, okay. I felt like yeah. getting a biopsy, a prostate biopsy from this sure, guy in his office would be like getting a back alley abortion. Oh, okay? Yeah. Yeah, you know, crazy. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, uh, I've, I've been in doctor's offices where they have their little room where they do procedures like colonoscopies and things like that. And they're, you know, they're really sterile and clean and so on. And I just never felt that he was, his, and my, my doctor agreed his offices are a mess. You know. Don't you change urologists? Well, so anyway, let me finish mm -hmm. the story. You don't let me finish the story. Oh, you're dragging it up. Well, I always drag stories out because I got two fucking hours to blow here. Are you kidding me? The slower I talk and the more I embellish, the faster the time goes by. So anyway, so uh, he says to me, um, you know what I'd do if I were you? He said, what? He said, I'd get a second opinion. Yeah. I said, well, you recommended this guy. Do you have another guy you can recommend? He says, I got a really good guy. He says, this guy's, you know. And, I, uh, and, and he recommended somebody else, and he said, go get a second opinion from this guy. So I called up his office, and I made the appointment. And they said a week from t Thursday, and my biopsy was going to be on the following Monday, and I figured that's cutting it too close, so I had every excuse to cancel my biopsy. And I, by the way, I asked my doctor, I said, if I cancel the biopsy, does it have to be done in two weeks? Does it have to be done in four weeks? He says, no, there's no rush. He says, there's no rush. It's probably a very slow-growing cancer anyway, if, the, if it is. He said, but why don't you go to this guy, and have, he's, he's a very conservative, you know, and he may have an entirely different take on the situation. Um, and my doctor did not feel comfortable with what this doctor was doing. Yeah. And, uh, oh, and then I also told him about my doctor saying, don't worry, if you've got cancer, we can cure it with hormones. Okay? Mm -hmm. We can cure it. We might have to use some radiation, but basically hormones. And I'm going... Just there. You know, I, number one, I don't know if I want that kind of cure, okay? Secondly, uh, I just, you know, let me add up. How many times I, I have to come in once a month for the shot, right? Oh, how much is he going to make once a month off of me by giving me the shot? So he's going to be ready to give me the shot when maybe I shouldn't be getting that. 
you know? So I, uh, um, uh, you know, I just think that I'm, I'm not comfortable with this doctor. And I called this other doctor and I said, I want to get a second opinion and I'm going to go see him. And if I like him, he's my new urologist, you know? There, uh, David Hajek got something called proton therapy. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, proton therapy wasn't available through Kaiser, but it was available through Stanford and UCSF and all the good insurances. Well, there are a lot so, of there are a lot of other things like that. There's CyberKnife, which has many different uh, names, which yeah. is radio controlled. And and the good thing about the CyberKnife is, instead of five uh, uh, Treatments, uh, so, uh, five treatments. treatment treatments a week for seven weeks. Oh no, no, no the proton therapy. No, 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 I'm not talking about the proton therapy, Phil. I'm talking about the cyber knife. Uh, this is like uh, five days, and that's it. Yeah, the same with proton therapy. It's every other day for uh, five treatments, so it's ten days yeah. total. Yeah. Well, in this case. Uh, um, you know, I who knows? I mean, I need that. I call. I got a hold of um, what's the number one uh, cancer uh, hospital? Sloan Kettering. Oh, Sloan. Yeah, I was just. And I got Sloan Kettering, and I said I I told them that I wanted to get a a second opinion. And they've kind of they have never called me back really. I mean, they put me through a couple of times. I talked to them, and they put me through one thing or another. And their problem, I think, was is that they are the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and unless you've been diagnosed with cancer, they don't want to see you. You know, if you just think you have cancer, they don't want to see you. All right, but they did say that they don't give biopsies, prostate biopsies. They don't oh. believe in them at Sloan Kettering. Now, this is I one of the two. best cancer centers in the world. I was going to say, if they don't give it, what does that say then? I had, I, two, I had two biopsies. And let me tell you, Alex, it was so much fun. I, I was laughing and scratching the whole way through. I couldn't believe how much fun I was having. You ought to try. It. Well, I, you know, <laughs> if, I ha if I have to, I will be happy to do it. But they do, in most cases, they numb people, but they probably knew you were a fucking Republican. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm telling you, the numbing doesn't work. <laughs> no, the numbing did work, according to Vernon Nunn. The yeah. numbing was fine. You know, they don't want you to be uncomfortable. I know. think Vernon's tougher than me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, he could take it. Well, I think you can also be put out too. Okay. They, if you ask for it, they, you can ask to be put out. But you know, they were. That's what my doctor was going to do. Yeah. Um, you know, but I. I I would rather go through a slight amount of pain without the anesthetic by a doctor who I have great confidence in, okay? Uh, I don't have confidence in this guy. I like him. He's nice. His bedside manner is terrific. He's like you have an old pal as a urologist. But If, if, you, if your general practitioner is telling you the guy's office is filthy, uh, you know, look for somebody else. Uh, I, well, he didn't yeah. say look for somebody else, but he said I would get. I would. He says I would get a second opinion. He said this is not, you know, this is going a little too fast. And I mentioned about you know the, the, the hormone treatments and whatever. And he said that's you know uh, he's going too too fast on this. You know, he was waiting for the minute that it went up enough that he could have an excuse to give me a. I mean, how much is he going to make doing a biopsy? You know, I you know I think that the biopsy, if I remember right, it was like three or four thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, I didn't have to pay that. I didn't pay anything, but it, it was three or four thousand dollars at Kaiser. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, uh, three or four thousand dollars. He, he of course he wants to give me a biopsy. Right. That's twenty five minutes out of his life and four thousand dollars in his pocket. You yeah. know. So how do I trust that? You know. I want I think somebody you're making the right decision. I want somebody. Yeah, and I don't think that if I hold it off a couple of weeks, even a couple no. of months, no. that it's going to be deadly for me. You know? I ignored it for a year and a half. Yeah, uh, I just I couldn't deal with it. So well, what kinda, you could well what you couldn't deal with, Phil, you said to me the other night, yeah. was you couldn't deal with the peeing problems. Well, that was that was why I decided to rip it out. Yeah, uh, because I I couldn't. Do you feel problems. that was the best decision? Uh, now that I've had it done, mm -hmm. 
No, I, I think that uh, they maybe could have done a turp. Well, they could have treated the cancer and maybe have done a, a turp, uh, which uh, yeah. would open up the area around the urethra and allow me to pee. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, uh, it, it, I, you know, I'm th I was thinking when you talked about your situation that you may have just gone into that just out of sheer frustration and said, rip it out. I don't want to put up that's these problems anymore. For years, I've been taking pills, uh, finasteride and Cialis, which have loosened all that up. I never have peeing problems, and that probably would have helped you, Phil. I took the Cialis. I didn't like the finasteride. The side effects made what? me feel... What? I didn't feel any side effects oh, from I, I, uh, There are side effects, and, and I got every one of them. Uh, so it didn't take long for me to decide that I, I was not interested in the finasteride. I think one of them was uh, retrograde ejaculation. Well, that's but, a, oh, no, you get to keep a lot of it. That's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the, my uh, girlfriend liked that the sheets were always clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, um, but uh, uh, the Cialis, you know, I mean, all, all those things could have could have probably helped you. But I think that... Uh, your doctors were probably too fast to do what they did. You know, they were too willing to jump into it. Well, I also had a nine that went up to seventeen, and mm -hmm. then, but that ended up being a uh, an infection. Yeah. And once I took Cipro, what was your it went what, 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 what was your Gleason score? Uh, it, they thought it was a three point four, but it was wait, actually wait, a four four. Wait a minute. Oh, oh, uh, that's two numbers together. Yeah. Yeah. A three four uh, would be a seven, and yeah. a four four would be an eight. Right, and six, four, four is a lot. Six is considered okay. Yeah, uh, I was, um, yeah, three, three. I, I was, um, because at the three, four. Gleason, uh, Gleason score, by the way, in case you don't know, is uh, Alice determines whether she wants to go to the moon. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's the Gleason test. Yeah, and if it's high enough, you, you yeah. go. But uh, after they did the uh, prostatectomy, they did a... a uh, is it a biopsy on the uh, on on the prostate, mm -hmm. and they found that my cancer was actually a four four, which was a lot higher than they thought. Mm -hmm. It's almost logarithmic. But know? they probably could have treated it with radiation. They offered to do that, and I wasn't willing to go to fifty radiation things. Well, then you should have looked into the cyber knife, which well, uh, you of course you were, what it. you were done is you were stuck with an HMO, and you had to take right. what they had available. Yeah, I'm just I, surprised. You know, I'm just surprised that Kaiser doesn't have the newer kinds of uh, treatments. You know. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, not that I need anything right now, but I'm going to uh, January first. Uh, I'm going, or actually before that, I'm going to sign up with UCSF, mm -hmm. which is a much better hospital than uh, Kaiser yeah and and then and then get my own local you know urologist not urologist but uh, a local uh, endocrinologist and some other things but this uh, this whole thing had me very panicked and very depressed um, you know all of a sudden I was I was feeling I was facing my own mortality you know which hey at my age who knows when you know um, but uh, it, it's just you don't know what to do, and you don't know whether your doctor is good or not. You know, you don't have any way to figure that out. You, you have to trust the doctor. Uh, Aren't there websites you can look these guys up on? And yeah, and get yeah. To... And uh, I, I went and looked him up, and one of the reviews said filthy toilets. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> filthy bathrooms, which is not the best thing in the world when you're asking people to pee in a cup. Okay, you know, you'd like just a little bit of, but it, it um, so I'm going to this other doctor who he says is more conservative and, and uh, it probably would handle this much better than he did. And in spite of the fact that my doctor recommended this guy to me, okay, but that's because it was his urologist and he just gave me, but he said, this guy, he said, and I looked up his credentials, he's, he's golden, you know. Yeah, uh, five well, five times listed uh, as one of New York's top urologists, you know, and so on, things like that. Well, because Mike Gleason was actually a four four, uh, I made the right decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was at the point where uh, if it was and it turned out to be that high, uh, it wasn't good. So and and the package or uh, hadn't burst because if that happened, then it spreads to the bone. 
Mm. And so I and I had another CT scan just before I had it done, just to make sure that it hadn't spread to the bone. And when I when they said no 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 it's 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 still intact, I said you just rip it out of there. Yeah. You know it's well you know I don't I I you know I could be that you know I, I would have this thing and he would come back and say it's nothing. You know we didn't find any. You know. Mm. Uh, that's always a possibility. I said, was that a possibility to him? He says, well, I don't know. You know, it doesn't look good. You know, it doesn't look, yeah. doesn't look yeah. terrific. And I, I mentioned this to my doctor, and he said, six, seven, that's not bad. He says, a free PSA of nine, well, that, you know, that creates a certain. First, I said to my doctor, I said, I had a six, seven. I said, so do you think maybe it's aggressive? He says, oh, six point seven. He, he, right? he said, it could be. And I said, uh, 6.7 would ma necessarily make it aggressive. And he said, well, that's not a good Gleason score. And I said, no, this yeah. isn't a Gleason score. I haven't had the biopsy yet. I said, this yeah. is my PSA. He says, oh, that's your PSA? Hell, that's nothing. Right. You that's know. Great. And he said, a, a close to a third of the men who I have in my office, uh, come into my office, my patients, Eleven. Have, a, a third of them at least have had prostate cancer as they got older. Uh, and he said only one of them had it seriously. That's in my entire time practicing. You know, he said uh, it's it's nothing. You know, and he said uh, if you you know you feel you don't want to go through with that biopsy, then go get a second opinion on this thing. You know, so I'm going uh, a week from Thursday to get a second opinion, and hopefully this guy will say, hey, you know, I mean it can be treated other ways. You know, we can watch it and see what happens. But, you know, I just don't like the way I've been terrorized with this whole thing. Now, I wasn't offered anything but the biopsy where they go in there and they and they take they punch into the prostate and hope that they get some of it out of there. But I understand that there are ways of doing it uh, otherwise where they inject you with the dye and then they do the MRI on it and they're, they're able to see. Well, they can do it with cells. an MRI. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly what Sloan Kettering does. But they said they don't yeah, do biopsies. Yeah, rather than just punch it 14 yeah, times yeah, and hope they, that they catch it. Yeah, and, and it, you know what could happen is here's what the doctor spread could, it. They can spread here, it. Here's what the doctor could say to you: uh, You, um, uh, gee, we we did the biopsy and none of the cores turned out to be malignant, and your Gleason right. score was. I don't know. Well, they wouldn't take a Gle they wouldn't do a Gleason score if you didn't score have any cancer. No, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then he would probably say to me, "So we're going to have to redo it in a year just to make sure it wasn't we didn't miss it." You know. Well, that you know, he, the thing that he said where he wasn't going to stick his finger up my ass because if I even if I had it, he might not be able to feel it was not to me a good excuse. To me, a good excuse was, hey, I feel a lump up there. We better go take, do a biopsy. I didn't know it was calcium. Uh, and, by, not, and, with and not the, a lump. With, with the use of the sonogram. Oh, okay. Yeah, you could see it. You know. Um, uh, uh, as you get older, uh, you get it's, it's an old prostate, for Christ's sake. You know? Well, you got a lot of use. Got a lot of use. But, you know, I may have gotten an infection or prostitutes at one time, and that could have left some calcium behind, you know. And it could be that what's showing up now is just an old fucking prostate acting up, you know. Um, but my doctor, I said, should I be concerned about this, and should I worry about it killing me? He says, nah. He said, I, that I wouldn't, you know. He said, I would be very surprised if this was uh, anything terribly serious, but, you know, the fact this guy wants to give you a, a, you know, a biopsy right off the bat, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem right to me. So why don't you go get a second opinion? So he sent me to this doctor for a second opinion, and I'm hoping that this guy isn't as bad as the last guy he recommended. Yeah. You know, and it's not that I don't like this doctor. And I said, how? Here was an interesting thing he said to me. I said, how? Uh, how good do you think he is? And he said to me, well, you know, urologists are a funny bunch of people. He said they're not really, they, 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 didn't, they didn't go to the big schools. <laughs> he said, and they're all, they all kind of suck. Basically, this is what he was saying to me. 
Well, he said, you know, they're a strange bunch. He said, if you found this, Jeff, that urologists are somewhat strange. You don't have your mic You're on. muted, Jeff. You're muted, Jeff. No, I don't. I'm sorry. I'm on. Uh, I don't have any uh, urologist that's bad. Okay. But I'm also very curious as to who I ask before I start. So I go to a very good doctor and he said, this is the one I'm going to. And he's the best of them all. Mm -hmm. You know, Jeff, uh, Jeff uh, has very cautious about that. Jeff has said, and he's very proud of the fact that he goes to, uh, was it Yale uh, yeah. Medical Center? And what I'm finding out from my friends who uh, have the ability to go around elsewhere besides Kaiser is this: this UCSF is also a teaching hospital uh, similar to the to the Yale. And everybody speaks so highly of UCSF out here, uh, the way that Jeff speaks of the Yale thing. Is there a hospital equal to that in New York City? That you could go to, like the like the Yale Med Center or the oh UCSF? yeah, you, you could go to uh, uh, the one that uh, Mehmet Oz uh, works at. Um, what the heck is it? Oh, he works at uh, a Wizard Presbyterian. The Presbyterian. Yeah. yeah. Are they a good a hospital for heart? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what what about the well, uh, well, prostate? I, you know, I personally, I got some issues with uh, Mehmet Oz. That's right. well, but the, you know the idea is that these teaching I think hospitals. He's more on TV than he is a doctor. Actually, they, you know, they he, observe, uh, you know, and uh, there, there's more uh, more people on it, and you know it might be a good place to go, even though it's Goyim, uh, you know. Well, I mean, I uh, most of the doctors I have are Mount Sinai, you know. Yeah, uh, which is a very good. Yeah, place. that's a good, good place. Good, good yeah. hospital. Yes, yes, Tony. My brother had his heart procedure in the hospital Oz works at, and I'll never forget this. Me and my sister were waiting in the room when the, my doctor's, my brother's doctor's team came out. Mm -hmm. Oz came out on his team and addressed my sister. Says, "You know who that is?" I says, "No, who is that?" She says, "That's Oz, the doctor from Oprah." I don't know who he was. So he does. He was on a surgical team uh, in the hospital. I think it was either Presbyterian. Or, I have to ask my brother. It might have been Columbia. I'm not sure where, where he had it done. My brother had the pig valve put in, and his doctors came out, so Oz is actually on. He he's a surgeon. He works there because he oh, came yeah. out and maybe you, the, maybe you want Oprah a major. surgeon. <laughs> you know, I, Oprah I, can afford the best. I, yeah. I I've worked with him on a couple of projects, so I I know, him, let's say, too personally, where it's it's an unfair assessment because it has nothing to do with. Well, oddly enough, you're not the only one of this group that has worked with him. He, uh, he went to do a show at Sirius Radio, and he was a fucking asshole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I don't even know who it no. I mean, I can tell you. I shall return. <laughs> yeah. uh, but anyway, I, I've seen him do surgery, too. Yeah. Many, yeah. And, and I thought he's, he's very capable and all of that, but. Now, you know, this this doctor, this other doctor... He's late. Yeah, this other doctor might just tell me, well, you really should get a biopsy because we don't know what's going on there. But I don't think so. I, because it seems to me the common wisdom right now is better to watch this stuff than immediately jump on it. And, and if you can't feel it with a digital, you can't see it on a sonogram, chances are it's not bad enough if it is there, to do anything about and just keep an eye on it. And this watchful waiting is a very common practice now uh, in, in that mm -hmm. area of medicine. And why this doctor, I mean, if watchful waiting to him was every six months having me take a blood test and be terrorized by that and then go see him where he wands me for a couple of minutes and makes 400 bucks, I don't know that that was watchful waiting, you know. And just because your prostate PSA goes up or it goes down, I mean, I had one point where it went up and then it went down again, you know. Uh, and, and who knows, you know, if I took a prostate, a PSA today, it might go back down into the four region, mm -hmm. you know. So but we don't. How, 
frequently was he taking your blood test? Well, the blood was once once every six months. Well, there's nothing wrong. Well, yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, I, yeah, I don't know that uh, he wasn't, it was terrorizing me in a lot of ways, you know? You think you bugged him enough about your prostate that he uh, was trying to make sure no. he didn't miss a beat? No. No. I, I you know, uh, to be honest with you, I don't think he really remembered who I was, okay? Mm -hmm. But he did a good job of faking it. All right? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't even know if my, my GP knows who the fuck I am until I come in and he sees my face, you know. Or your uh, chart. Yeah, yeah. Well, they always look at the chart and then they say, so how is your wife, uh, Marjorie? Uh, you know. Um, but... Uh, the, the point is that I just, I never felt good about this guy because he was doing stuff in a weird way, you know? I mean, with, with the wanding me all the time and not stinking his finger up my ass till the last time, and then he did the rectal because I said, why don't you ever do the rectal? So he did the rectal, and he felt around there, and I, you know, I'm sure if he had felt anything, he would say, well, there's something not good there, you know? I mean, that's what a doctor would do, right? They would tell you what they felt or didn't feel. And I asked him, uh, how, how was it? And he says, it's, it's, it's larger than, you know, you have a rather large prostate. He said, and, uh, you know, but he didn't say he felt any lumps or anything like that. So I assume it was okay. Otherwise, if he had felt a lump, you know, he would have done a biopsy immediately. So... Uh, and then he stuck the wand up my ass, and he said all he saw was calcium. You know, so I, I, you know, I just don't feel comfortable that he has enough evidence to say let's do a biopsy just because the PSA went up. It's not high enough to do a biopsy. Hmm? Your PSA isn't high enough to do a biopsy. It's too close to normal. Well, you know? it, it's not exactly normal, and this free PSA is, is low, which is not good. Um, my last report said I had an 85% chance of cancer. But then this last one, it said the same point nine, and it didn't say that. So yeah. I don't know. You know, I don't know whether I've got it or I don't have it. But, you know, chances are something else will kill me first. Although my heart's in pretty good shape, you know. Of course, you know, if I take the hormones, it could fuck my heart up. That's one thing yeah. hormones can do. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of things it could do. So I, you know, I just don't like the idea that this guy's going, well, you know, I just uh, shoot people up with the hormones and they're fine after that. Mm -hmm. You know, their PSA just drops precipitously. Mm -hmm. And I'm beginning, you know, I got to say, ladies and gentlemen, that having gone through this, and this isn't just me trying to, trying to uh, uh, keep myself calm or whatever. But I honestly believe that uh, this whole thing with the PSA tests is really a terrible thing because most evidence shows that it's not it, – it, it, let me put it this way. Um, you, get a, you get a wart on your hand. Now, it could be malignant, but chances are it's not malignant. But you don't just look at the wart and go, oh, we better have a con uh, you know, take that thing off and do a biopsy. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you don't go crazy on stuff like this. And the PSA test, while people who have cancer, yes, their PSA goes up, okay? But in something like 75% uh, of the cases where they've done biopsies based on the fact that the PSA has gone up, there was no cancer, okay? So what you're saying is, yes, there's a causal relationship with PSA going up, but it's not. But if you think conversely about does it mean you have cancer, the answer is probably not. They're putting less and less credence into the PSA test, although it's not a bad thing to get as long as you don't overreact. Well, you know. well but, but, you know, the, what happens is at my age, is you're doing a PSA test, number one, it's terrorizing me, and secondly, you're going to over-prescribe what you're going to do. You're going to do the biopsy, you know, you're going to find a little bit of cancer, and then you're going to give me the hormones. What? You know, why? What's, yeah. what's, what's the, 
you know. Uh, had you talked to uh, Ronnie, who's somebody that was going th is going through? I, I uh, don't want to talk to about Ronnie about that. I mean, I've talked to her about this, but not to yeah. any great extent because, right. believe me, no advice. She, she has a problem. Okay, yeah. I right now I I only have an annoyance. Right. All right. So I, I I I really don't want to minimize her plight by talking to her about this. Well, yeah. you've had an annoyance for a long time. I've been on the show almost every night. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but I that's voluntary. Yeah. So anyway, so that that was my story, and that's why I was off for a couple of nights. I was just so dis distressed about it. And I didn't want to talk about it because, uh, quite frankly, I didn't know what to do about it. And, uh, you know, I was very mad at the fact that Sloan Kettering, you know, they said, well, we'll call you back and let you know if we found a doctor that's willing to talk to you. But it was like they weren't interested because I didn't have a diagnosis of cancer. She said, if you get a diagnosis, and she told me when I first called that if you get a diagnosis, if they you do the a biopsy and you get a diagnosis of cancer, call us and we'll make an appointment, you know. Mm -hmm. But they didn't, I don't think they wanted to hear from me because it is called the Sloan Kettering Cancer, cancer Center. Okay. Yeah. That's no, like, you weren't a qualified that's like uh, me going customer. To the, it's like me going to the cancer centers of America, although if I had cancer, that's the last place I would go. But the cancer centers of America because I had a cold. You know, I mean, you just, they're not going to see you. What, you've got to, well, sorry, we don't treat colds here. Yeah, yeah it's a cancer cold. Yeah. So, yeah, do you think it's cancer? I chew. Yeah. So, um, so that, you know, that, that's pretty much, it. that's been my plight. Uh, and um, yeah. if people wanted to know why uh, I was um, um, depressed, depressed, that was it, you know. And, and uh, well, uh, uh, Phil knows how depressed I was because he kept writing me and I didn't even want to talk about it, you know. Uh, because I, I knew that anything you would tell me, Phil, while it was born out of your own experience, mm -hmm. that your experience is not necessarily going to be my experience. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's kind of like Woody Allen used to have a joke in his act about... Uh, um, we had this friend, his name was Bob, and Bob got sick, and he had the same thing that I had. Oh, oh no, he got sick with the same thing that I had, so um, we sent him to a doctor so I wouldn't have to go to the doctor, and three weeks later, he was dead. He said, but I, I, I just, my cold, my, my ailment cleared up. Wasn't that a Jack Benny thing? Well, no, no. Uh, no about going? No, it's a Woody no. Allen story. Oh. But anyway... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm reminding me to tell you something in a moment. Uh, but anyway, that's, you know, uh, that's, that's my story. And I, I, I think I probably, hopefully I'm going to get a better perspective on this from this other doctor. Uh, and if he's good, you know, I guess if you go to somebody for a second opinion and you like him, you can say, hey, you're my doctor, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think they would mind that. No. You you want. I, I would imagine a lot of times people who go to get second opinions wind up with that doctor, you know. So yeah. it's a possibility. Well, look, you know, it, it it's my life that's at stake here, and I want to make sure that whoever's dealing with me. I mean, if he wants to do a, a prost, if he wants to do a biopsy, fine. If he feels that things are terrible, fine. I just want somebody that I can trust. Okay. And that is, you know, that m putting my life in their hands, it's going to be okay. You know, I don't think I need to put my life in anybody's hands. I think if I didn't go get a biopsy, I would probably die of something else anyway. And, and Sometimes I, hmm? the biopsies can do more damage than because uh, yes. they can spread the cancer. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Anyway, I, a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, let's forget about that. Okay, but I just wanted to explain it, folks, because a lot of people wondered, you know, what was up. Um, uh, a couple of things. Number one, I get a call the other day from Bobby Slate. Oh, yeah. He's working with... Uh, he's in Spain. What, yeah, he called me from Woody Spain. Allen. Yeah, he's working with Woody Allen on his latest film. He's there's only, like, two scenes. And the last time he worked on a Woody mm -hmm. film... They cut him out of the film, so you know, 
Uh, but, but on the series, he was uh, he was with him uh, in the uh, he had in, one in the he had one episode. Yeah, and he had a yeah. good shot there. Good yeah. good acting shot. So I'm I'm talking to him, and he had started out by sending me a um, a note. You know, a, 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 what do you call it? A text saying, "I'm here in Spain. I'm doing Woody's film." Um, gee, I guess I've lost my place to stay in New York. So I wrote back, what do you mean? And next thing I know, I get a call from Bobby from Spain. Okay, he's in Mallorca, I think is where they're filming. And um, he says, whenever I came to New York, the guy who put me up was Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> He said he had this apartment house he owned, and he kept a lot of the apartments available for friends who would come in and out of town. And he was a, I was, he was a big fan of mine and said, anytime you're in New York, you need a place to stay, just let me know, and I'll give you one of the apartments to stay in. He said, that's where I stayed all the time. He said he was also a friend of Woody's as well. That's how I met him. Or I, I'm, I, think, I think he said that, he asked Woody, do you know Bobby Slayton? And he wanted to invite Bobby to do some party for him or something like that. But that that's where Bobby stayed when he was in New York. He was friends with Jeffrey Epstein. So, uh, and... He's running and, a good company. And Woody says, I don't want anybody to know I know him because I got enough <laughs> problems down. of my own, you know. Uh, uh, but he did say, he did say Epstein was a very weird guy he said that he he uh, very very seldom left the house wow. you, know, you had a twenty one thousand square foot 77 million dollar mansion in midtown yeah. would you leave <laughs> well to go to go to my to go, hundred square feet you don't leave <laughs> to, to go to my uh, my island in Jamaica or wherever that island was he's and got twenty one thousand square feet Twenty-one thousand square feet. Yeah, we know he's home. That's about ten times larger than my apartment. Right. <laughs> they must live in a totally different world. I mean, he's so rich. It's like everybody's bringing him. Well, he's in the sixties. Well, he's not. He's not <laughs> as rich as you thought. They say his worth was only about uh, um, what five hundred million? Did they say? Yeah. No, well, he, he probably spent a lot on. He, he didn't uh, on hit attorneys. it. He, he wasn't a billionaire. Um, but he had two he had two jets, and he owned an island, and um, he um, uh, had a home in uh, Florida, a home here, you know. And uh, added to that, I said to Bobby, I said, "Well, did you get ever get a sense that yeah. Jeffrey Epstein was this way?" And he said, "Never." He said, wow. "I saw him, I saw him with some beautiful women, but they weren't underage." He said, I've never seen, I never saw him with young women, you know, you know girls, young girls. Yeah, we may find out that uh, they don't have much on this guy. You know, they're just pissed that he, they didn't get the conviction that they wanted years uh, that ago. That could be, you know, uh, uh, but, I mean, it's kind of amazing Um uh, uh, that uh, the people who know him say that uh, well I never knew that I was surprised that Bobby was said he was very surprised when he when he heard about Epstein getting arrested for this you know yeah a guy like Dershowitz uh, was his attorney originally he was on the OJ case Dershowitz has yes. problems right now doesn't he uh, Epstein <laughs> no D Dershowitz has some problems now uh, yeah somebody accused him of something yeah. and he's totally denying it um uh, I don't remember what he was accused of, but it was something salacious, I think. Yeah, yeah. Do you think this could be political, Alex? Do you think maybe there's more to the story? Than I don't know if there's anything political with Epstein because Epstein isn't uh, isn't He's just very a much a political guy. He's a donor. Yeah. But he did, did have ties to Trump, though, so it did make. No, he had ties, ties to Clinton. No, he had ties to Clinton. He had ties to oh, Trump. Yeah. He had listen. He had ties to Bobby Slayton. Okay, you know. I mean, this is a guy who, who ingratiated himself to well-known people or people who he, like in Bobby's case, he liked his comedy and so on and so forth, you know. And he's pretty good. 
So, you know, that, that, that was, um, uh, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, you can't, you can't blame somebody like uh, Clinton who, when uh, Jeffrey said, okay, um, if you want to use my airplane to get to your various things, uh, I think it was an African sojourn that he had to do for the Clinton Foundation, uh, he, he used his plane. So does that mean that he's guilty of something? No. Uh, just like, I, as I said, the fact that Trump knew this guy, a lot of people knew this guy down in that part of the country. And, uh, um, you know, it's not that Trump was getting women from him or anything like that, so I'm not going to try and throw that on Trump either. So, I mean, just because somebody got close to Jeffrey Epstein doesn't mean they're a leper. Okay, so that yeah. was my other. Uh, and the other story, thing that I wanted to talk about was that I uh, uh, I lost a friend this weekend. No, uh, another, another one. Uh, oh, Krasner. Paul Krasner. Yeah. yeah, that was it. I was surprised. I saw the comments. And it's funny because um, I was talking with Walter Sabo. Walter Sterling a couple of weeks ago. This is the reason he wanted me to be on his radio show, on the radio show when he did uh, Jim Bohannon's show, was he wanted me to come on and talk about my remembrances of Woodstock. And I was mentioning Paul Krasner because the funny part about Woodstock was I could only stay there a day because I had to drive back to the city in order to do my radio show because the radio station wouldn't put a line in at Woodstock for me to do my radio show from, from the Woodstock Festival. Their uh, thinking about it was, well, why would we want to put a phone line in there? What's the Woodstock Festival going to be? Yeah. <laughs> and 30 the, the, people? Mm, the story was that if you had had a phone line into Woods, the Woodstock Festival, we would have been the only phone line, the only broadcast line into the festival. We could have turned that into a bloody fucking fortune. Yeah, because they probably, would have let, they probably would have let us tap into their audio, all of that. You know, you might have been able to get interviews with Jimi Hendrix, maybe, or any of It would have been worth more than the moon tapes. The, probably. Probably. That. But anyway, they said, so I had to go back to New York. Well, Krasner had to go back to New York too because he was uh, he was dating a, a soap opera star and her name was what was her name Jada I'm trying to remember now she was she was a very famous soap opera actress that he was dating and he had to get back to go on a date with her so he drove back from Woodstock with me so we both punked out on the Woodstock festival after the first day because we had to get back to New York me to work and him to get laid um, uh, uh, so anyway, that was, uh, uh, but I knew Paul for, God, I don't know how long. And at one point, uh, he had problems with The Realist. The Realist was his magazine, and it was a famous magazine. And, uh, he, uh, he, you know, it was never a profit maker for him. And at one point, he was on the edge of going out of business, closing up the magazine. And he came to me and he said, do you have any money you could lend me? And I can't remember how much I lent him. My business manager would have to tell me. He would probably remember. But it may have been somewhere in the range of $5,000 that I got Paul. And that saved the realist. You know. So that's how close Paul and I were. And by the way, Paul paid them every cent of that back. Uh, not, you know, my feeling is you lend somebody money like that, you pretty well kiss a goodbye. You better make sure it's money you're not going to use. And I didn't, uh, I didn't, um, 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 you know, I, I figured that, you know, I didn't expect he was ever. And then all of a sudden, Gary gets a check, you know, maybe a year later, something like that, but he paid it off. But Paul and I were friends, and we were good enough friends that he could ask me for $5,000. Uh, but uh, I, I, I always liked the guy, and um, uh, I, I knew him quite well. And I guess I feel bad that I haven't gotten a hold of him in the last couple of years to say hello and to 
you know, check up on him and see what was happening. Where's his funeral? I have no idea. I have no idea. There's nothing about a funeral. Uh, he died. He was 87 years old. Wow. Yeah. He died in uh, maybe <coughs> Palm Desert. Mm. Uh, or maybe it was someplace in, uh, let's see here. Let me, let me look it up here. But he, um, he died, but they said he had been in hospice. Now, what does that mean exactly, Jim? He died hospice. at home. That's hospice. Oh, that's no, no, that's yeah, it's, it's when they're on death watch, basically, yeah. and they're only giving you drugs just to keep you out of pain. Yeah, but, but isn't that usually in a hospital setting? Could be. But he supposedly died at home, and um, um, what does it say? Um, and, and naturally, Reverend, uh, he was co-founder, blah, 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 blah. This is the New York Times thing. It's going to take forever to get through. Uh, let's see. A Krasner kind of Probably concept. fake. Huh? It's probably fake. Probably fake. He's not dead at all, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, let's see here. Had he, you no, know, it's, it, it, it's not. Howard Smith wrote that. Oh, no, Harrison Smith. Wrote that. I can't. I uh, can't find the uh, place where he died. Damn it. Uh, hmm. He also created the term yippie. Oh, he did. That's yeah, cool. and, and created the yippies. He and and. Uh, Ed I just did a search on eBay, Alex, for the magazine The Realist. People are selling them old magazines. I should buy one of them for you. Yeah, Terry Gross, Fresh Shares, and some bag. He died Sunday at the age of 87. Doesn't say, none of these things are saying where he died, but I saw one article which said where he died. And uh, let's see here. Cool. He's got one. Well, he wrote for Mad. In one magazine. of the magazines, he's got one. Oh, pretty cool. I'm going to have to get one. He wrote for Mad Magazine. He was also, you know, the editor of The Hustler for a year. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, he wrote for Mad Magazine in the 50s. He launched Political Satire Magazine in 1958, Realist. Uh, he also was, he also edited uh, and co-wrote uh, Lenny Bruce's autobiography, uh, sure. How to Talk Dirty and Influence People. So he had quite a quite a life. This guy. He was a great. Uh, he, he must have been smart. It, it was very important to the uh, to the counterculture and to uh, all of this. You know what's funny? The '60s really drew so many. With the culture exploding, I find what I what's amazing. Remember, all oh, drugs are bad. How many smart minds did drugs? It didn't bother them. So how big can it really have been? Well, I liked what uh, Bill Hicks said once. He said, if you don't think drugs are good, just realize that all the good music you've listened to, all the great books you've written to, yeah. people were high when they wrote them or sang them. Okay? And uh, she's being buried at the George Funeral Home, which is in Wareton, Ontario, Canada. What? Yeah, the George Funeral Home. Wait a minute. It, it's no. on. It's in Wareton, Ontario, Canada. Phil, Phil, that doesn't make sense. The well, man. I just looked up uh, his obituary, and it's uh, and it. Uh, you know, unless this was an advertisement, which I don't think so. It says funeral home arrangements uh, entrusted to the George Funeral Home of Wareton. So they have well, a. Well, link but he didn't even says, die close to Canada, Phil. Yeah, I'm telling you. Just go to his obituary, uh, uh, and uh, it says, In memory of Paul Kastner, 1927. Kastner? Did you look up Kastner? Oh, he's got the wrong name. You got the uh, wrong no. name, Phil. Oh. Okay. You have to go to a different cemetery to visit the guy. <clears throat> Paul um, Well, we'll all go see Paul Kastner up in Ontario. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. He's spelling it. Uh, I spelled it wrong. Hey, you it know, isn't th it isn't this guy. No, it's not that guy. No, <laughs> no, right. no, Phil. No. Uh, and by the way, everybody, time for a drink. Yeah, uh, well, in I fact, it, I think this would be two or three drinks. This one. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me look a little closer. Uh, yeah. Well, you ought to go to this guy's funeral. You know, I mean, he was a nice guy too. Yeah. Well, should I? Let's see here. Let's see if I can find one more article where they might actually say. Uh, yeah. Oh, 
Desert Hot Springs. Hell of a place. Yes. Uh, and his daughter, Holly Kasner. Uh, Krasner. Uh, <laughs> I got you saying it now. He, he had, uh, it was 87 and recently transitioned to hospice care after an illness. But they won't say what the illness was. So. Mm. Prostate. Yeah. Uh, what could it be? You know, I mean, I, well, sometimes on, people just don't want to say. Though, you know, I got to tell you, where was it? Uh, in, um, in Russia, when they do obituaries, they never say what the person died of. It's considered improper to do. It's usually due to an oligarch or uh or It's usually Putin. due usually yeah. a bullet to the head, but you know, <laughs> I mean um you know, on YouTube they, they have and you talk about Russia, they mm -hmm. have all of these traffic accidents uh that people have uh dash cams yeah. and and uh you know you, you can see all these traffic accidents. So I watch I binge watch a bunch of traffic accidents and I went out and got a dash cam the other day. So far, nothing. <laughs> I'm nothing. hoping that it's uneventful. What I like doing with the old TV show, if anybody remembers when we did it as a TV show from a studio, this, this yeah. little thing, I used to get those dash cams, and then we yeah. would run them on the screen. It was, you know, the blue screen them onto me, and I would pretend like I was driving. <laughs> and, and we would have one crash after another, hitting a cow, you know. So Yeah. Some of those things are amazing. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, and... and People live. And there are a lot of dash cam footage on the Internet, on YouTube. Yeah. Well, I understand that there's a lot of fraud going on in, in uh, insurance fraud that happens in uh, well, Russia. Well, that's why they all have yeah, those cameras. Have. Yeah. You know, so that when there's an accident, they can say, see, I didn't cause it. You know. Well, I figured... If I had a dash cam, I wouldn't get in an accident because, uh, you know, I could prove I was right or most, wrong. Most and of the, and this is the truth, most of the uh, dash cams uh, are, um, um, they were like almost every car in Russia has a dash cam. Yeah. Yeah. And that's to prevent fraud. You know, people fraudulently saying, hey, uh, you know, uh, he hit me and I was, you know, because they, what they do is they would just hit somebody, and then say, oh, the guy rammed into me, and then sue right. them, you know. Right. So now everybody has these cameras, and there's this endless amount of footage. I mean, there was a meteor one night that hit a yeah, certain place in Russia, yeah. and about five different dash cams had pictures yep. of the meteor. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty valuable. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what are they saying now, the, the ring doorbell? Yeah, video doorbell that they keep the uh, they keep the video. <laughs> yeah, pe people like those things. No, but uh, that they keep the video on the cloud. But they're only claiming for a couple of days or maybe weeks. But they're yeah. claiming that this is a, a you know a, a problem with the personal space and so on. So I don't know. You know, this this goes on constantly. I don't care. Steal my, you know. Well, I, I have uh, four cameras at the store. Uh, it's getting dark, so it's hard to see. But I can see live on the phone the four cameras. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting stuff. You know, I've seen people yeah. on my dumpster. Well, my friend Shecky has one of those. And he, from anywhere yeah. in the world when he's on vacation, can watch somebody robbing <laughs> his home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's, or driving his car. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Waving goodbye. I hope we're having a nice time in uh, Portofino, Italy, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, we're here stealing your cat. You know, <laughs> well, you know tomorrow is uh, uh, your friend uh, uh, Ruben is going to be at the uh, punchline. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm not going to go. Yeah. Anyway, hey, l listen. Listen. That's it. We uh, we pretty much run out of time. Uh, you guys have been terrific for sticking with me tonight. I wish we had some more, but this was a nice group. Phil, uh, Jeff, uh, Tony, and Charlie. And if you'll all wave goodbye, I'll wave back, and then uh, the audience will wave back at you, although you can't see them do it. And there I go. Okay. Let me just go over here to the uh, Skype line and hang up on them unceremoniously and get the lines ready so that our good friend Jack 
will be able to, um, Jack uh, Bishop will be able to, to use the same said lines for his program, which is the intersection, which is next over most of the same station. I'll be back again, uh, let's see here, is it tomorrow night? Yes, it is tomorrow night, 10 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her, okay? Bye-bye, everybody.